Our next uh, speaker is Dr. James Garvin. He's the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Executive Officer at Helena Village. Uh, he's Clinical Professor of Medicine, Emory University School of Medicine. He really doesn't need any introduction to this audience, Dr. Garvin. He's going to be talking about choosing antiglycemic agents in patients with concomitant heart disease, current and emerging, uh, emerging data. We are very uh, glad to have him given a uh, talk with us again this year. Thank you. Thank you, Tundi. It's a pleasure to be here and to be joined by uh, this distinguished faculty and to speak to you once again on these important topics. So our pretest here is going to be in the form of um, there's a case that actually precedes the question. Where, where's Judy's story? If you saw her story, you'd understand the question. Do we have a case? Don't have a case. Uh, I, I don't have the case. Uh, the case was going to be on the slide. I, <laughs> I, did, I didn't bring her case up here with me to, to have all of the, the, the points. Um, and all of the points are necessary in order to understand the specifics of the questions that have been asked. Um, I'm going to talk about the choice of anti-glycemic agents in patients with concomitant heart disease. Now, Sharita has already broached this subject and has dealt with it in uh, some detail, uh, and actually she saved me uh, a little time in some spaces. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures. I'm seldom in conflict with anybody because I work with everybody. Um, <laughs> So these are the objectives that we hope to achieve. We're going to talk about uh, the uh, context for the emergence of the CVOTs. This is going to be what you see for cardiovascular outcomes trials in diabetes and talk about some of their differences in design uh, and the implications of them. We're going to talk about the results from many of these completed trials, focusing on what their impact has been in the area of cardioprotection. And then we're going to look at the uh, clinical implication of these trials generally and how they have redefined the way we think about treatment. And you already heard some of that uh, emerge uh, from uh, Sharita's talk. So these are some reflections for consideration in response to this general question. What can we do to improve clinical outcomes in diabetes uh, management? Well, clearly, we need to start by <coughs> comprehensively uh, reassessing the complexity of the, comp of the pathophysiology of type 2 uh, diabetes and how that informs the approaches we take to treatment because we need to think about moving beyond chasing an A1C target. It's a complex pathophysiology that requires more than achieving a blood glucose level. Uh, we need to assign a great deal more urgency to the unmet needs that drive CVD morbidity and mortality, and then reorder the sequence and the mix of treatments based on the evidence, some of which you've already heard about, including uh, data from the CVOTs, and then acknowledge the urgency for addressing CVD presence and risk using some of these newer agents that have been shown to be effective against CVD, and finally to acknowledge the urgency for earlier initiation and intensification of therapy that will actually reduce uh, CVD. Uh, you found the case study. Okay, well now that you know what you ought to be reflecting on, uh, just start reflecting as we go back and think about these, uh, these two cases, okay? Are we ready to roll tape? Since they have it, but it will be a little difficult to project. Here's the, here's the case. Judy is a 56-year-old woman who was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes about three and a half years ago, had a strong family history of type 2 diabetes and a high risk for cardiovascular disease. In fact, her brother died of an MI at the age of 61. Judy's A1C is currently 9.7%. Her blood pressure is 142 over 90. 
Her LDL is 122 uh, milligrams per deciliter, and her BMI is 29. Initially, Judy didn't want to take any diabetes medication. She opted for lifestyle modification. Plus, she did agree to take blood pressure medicines and statins. But after several months, she started taking um, metformin. After one year on lifestyle plan and at metformin at two grams a day, she actually brought her A1C down from 9.7 to 8.5, and she had a DPP-4 added. How about, however, by that time, her BMI had increased to 30.2. Her blood pressure was 132 over 82. Her LDL had come down on statins to 88 uh, milligrams <coughs> per deciliter. She now comes back for follow-up. Despite her adherence to the metformin and the lifestyle medication, uh, her A1C is still 8.5%. So you see why I want you to see the case, because there was a lot of nuance there. In order to reduce her risk, now focusing on CBD uh, progression, while assuring that she gets to the best out, uh, glycemic control possible, the newer guidelines from ADA and or ACE recommend that you either, one, intensify her treatment using any of the approved agents, two, evaluate her for the presence of ASCVD, C, achieve a blood pressure of less than 130 over 80 and an LDL of, uh, of less than 85, D, consider fixed dose combinations so you could simplify her treatment. Or in fact, none of these are currently recommended in these guidelines. So now you can vote while you continue to reflect. Okay, so here's, um, the answers are sort of all over the place. Um, as I expected them to be, intensification, uh, any, using any agents, evaluate for the presence of ASCVD, and so forth. You're going to see the poster. Ah, here is the uh, second case. Tom. All right, well, you're going to see Judy again after all is said and done. Now, this is Tom, okay? He's a 55-year-old man who was diagnosed with type 2 about five years ago with a BMI now 38. He has a busy lifestyle. He has a very heavy travel schedule. He has a cholesterol that's 273. Blood pressure here, uh, 144 over 82, EGFR of 60. He also has a strong family history of CVD, and he also has a history of exertional chest pain. He actually uh, had it. Um, the treatment plan for Tom was to put him on a statin, a channel blocker, lifestyle modification, improve his nutrition, try to get him to lose some weight, put him on metformin, two grams a day, and he's uh, been put on a DPP-4 inhibitor. On this plan, his weight has come down by five pounds. His exercise tolerance, which was pretty poor to start with, is much improved. And on this treatment plan, his A1C has come down to 9.1%. What are the preferred next steps in his treatment? So the question to you, would you, in order to reduce Tom's risk of CVD, while assuring his optimal glycemic control, using the newer guidelines, would, uh, would the recommendations now be that you would A, optimize reduction of his risk factors using standard of care. Two, add an SGLT2 inhibitor with monitoring of his EGFR. Three, consider for Tom a once weekly GLP-1 receptor agonist but stopping the DPP-4 inhibitor, or D, consider his obesity, his EGFR, and his lifestyle to drive the choice of therapy that you make, or E, all of the above are currently supported by the guidelines. Please vote now. Okay, so it looks like uh, this group, thanks to Sharita, uh, uh, believes that all of the above are su supported by the guidelines, and we're going to come back to both these cases in the post-test. So let's, can we pick up where I was before I was so rudely uh, interrupted? 
Okay, so when we think about reflections in the management of type 2 diabetes, it's very important to consider that eye disease, kidney disease, nerve disease, are not the leading causes of death in this disease. Almost 80% of the deaths in diabetes are due to some form of heart disease and stroke. And in fact, even though we've done better with the implementation of good standards of care, um, and you can see over time from the uh, late 1990s through the current uh, uh, years, or uh, uh, recent, more recent years, we've come a long way. We are doing better in terms of reducing deaths from cardiovascular disease and hospitalizations for CV disease, but we still have a lot of disparity. There's a big gap between people with diabetes and healthy controls. So we have a lot to do. When you look at the pre-CVOT era, where the holy grail was to try to achieve normal glycemia. That's what we were trying to achieve. And we did so with a variety of approaches. Type 1 diabetes, the DCCT, uh, and then we uh, looked at uh, the use of metformin and sulfonylureas in, te uh, in studies like the UK PDS. And then we had uh, Accord, Advance, uh, VADT. Um, and we found that there were, in fact, a spectrum of outcomes. Most of the short-term outcomes showed that there really wasn't any change in CV outcomes. CV mortality or composite CV outcomes, longer-term follow-up, like EDIC for DCCT, showed that there was some decrease in CV composite outcomes and mortality. In the UK PDS, longer-term follow-up showed that you did, in fact, over time, get better uh, results. But for the most part, results using high, uh, normal glycemia as a goal did not show that we could do a lot about changing CV outcomes in diabetes. And so in the pre-CVOT era, where the quest was for normal glycemia, we just didn't get it done in terms of reducing CVD um, uh, outcomes. And then there was something that happened in 2008 the FDA released its guidelines for industry regarding diabetes drugs and their approval, and then that ushered in, uh, ush into the CVO2 era. Now, what was that thing that happened? Well, there were some things that happened that uh, showed, for example, concerns about the CV safety of anti-diabetes drugs. There was a controversial meta-analysis that was published in the New England Journal. Uh, there were meta-analyses of some of the emerging um, 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 TZDs or glitazones, uh, miraglitazar that showed more than twice the incidence of CV complications um, uh, versus standard therapy. And, and what happened was there was a, a, a thing with rosiglitazone that suggested there may be more ischemic events. And all of this sort of bubbled up into uh, a hubbub about uh, the safety of these anti-diabetes drugs and the FDA issued a safety guidance. And basically what it said is that if you want to get a drug for diabetes approved, you've got to make sure that that drug um, will not result in an unacceptable increase in CV risk. And that's what ushered in the CVOT era. And we've got a lot of them that have been reported out, a lot of them that are going on, and a lot of them that are yet to be reported out. Different classes of drugs, different types of CVO uh, outcome studies, and different results. And what you see here, uh, we're in 2019, where we've had a host of studies that have been reported out, and then there are more to come, uh, not lo just looking at cardiovascular outcomes, but looking at renal outcomes uh, and, uh, uh, and, and the like. Now, when we look at a summary of the first CVOT, they were with the DPP-4s because they were the first drugs in line for the new safety regulations. And to make a long story short about the DPP-4 inhibitors, didn't matter which one we looked at, okay, uh, uh, Saxa, Sita, Alla, uh, Lenig, all of them, okay, basically showed no effects on MACE, on major adverse cardiovascular events, so CV effects were 
pretty much uh, neutral, okay? but they were safe. And uh, there was a, um, a signal, a suggestion that some of them may have been associated with an increased risk of hospitalization for congestive failure, but not a very strong signal uh, for that. But overall, they were considered pretty much neutral and uh, the DPP-4 inhibitors um, uh, received a pass. They weren't viewed with any real concern. But then we had a number of other trials that followed. Trials now with the uh, SGLT2 inhibitors that included Impareg and Canvas, um, uh, trials with uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists that included LIDA, Rewind, Sustain-6, uh, Harmony, Excel, uh, and then Declare and Credence were also uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, and Iris was with Pioglitazone. So there were a lot of CVOTs. Now, I'm not going to give you details on all of them, but the fact of the matter is that when we look across uh, these trials with SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists, what we find is, one, that they were pretty big trials. Semagl semaglutide here uh, was one of the smaller ones, at 3,200-plus uh, uh, patients, but the rest, you can see, were pretty uh, big trials, reasonably long, except for these last two were, were, were shorter. And you can see that they all had composite outcomes, and they were CVD outcomes, major adverse cardiovascular events. Okay. And for the most part, they all achieved statistical significance. And they had to show statistical significance for superiority compared to standard of care, not just uh, equivalence or non-inferiority. Okay? And then all of the uh, different um, adverse events were um, captured. Now, I, I po point out here that uh, DECLARE, which was one of the more recent SGLT2 inhibitors, REWIND was one of the more recent uh, GLP-1s. It was uh, reported out at this year's uh, ADA meeting in San Francisco. And then CREDENCE, which was also reported out uh, recently, uh, uh, not too long ago, but this was a kidney trial with, with an SGLT2 inhibitor, not a CVD outcome trial, uh, CVOT. And, and this one really was designed to, to test the efficacy of this SGLT2 inhibitor on reducing progression of, of end-stage or chronic kidney disease in, in type 2 diabetes. The reason I've highlighted a couple of things here is that, one, in Rewind, done with the GLP-1 receptor agonist dulaglutide, the baseline A1C was a mean of 7.3. This is the lowest G, uh, A1C mean of any of these CBOTs. These people were as good as most of us ever get. They wouldn't have qualified for most of the uh, CBOTs. So you can see that there were a lot of implications here for preventive uh, 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 therapy, okay, uh, in terms of effects on these cardiovascular outcomes. And, and, and it was a fairly short uh, uh, study uh, as well. It was a small study and a relatively uh, short study, but it had a lot of people in it who had no established CVD, okay? And then the thing that was important about Credence is that this was with canagliflozin, and this was the same SGLT2 inhibitor that uh, suffered from the infamy of a signal of increased amputations in the um, CVOT, the CANVAS trial, well, Credence, which was started way years ago before that signal was ever published, Credence had no such signal. That amputation signal with canagliflozin did not uh, emerge, and that's a very uh, important outcome. So why are the SGLT2 inhibitors important here in terms of where they now emerge for their use in uh, the prevention of CVD. Well, the thing that drove the statistical significance in the CVOT for Impareg was the effect on CV death. Most of that um, statistical significance was because of this robust benefit in reducing CV death at both doses compared to placebo, okay? Now, with respect to Canvas, the statistical significance that resulted in superiority, that is, um, that gave it uh, su superior uh, effects on, on MACE, was across the board. It was because of the combined effects on uh, CV death, on, on 
um, whatever else is up here, I can't read it. <laughs> Non-fatal non myocardial infarction. Yeah, you know, the angle here is terrible. You know, you got to crook your neck up here like this and, this, and the confidence monitor is about 15 yards away. Uh, and, and, I, and I'm old, I need glasses up here. Uh, but, but anyway, you can see that there is a beneficial effect across the spectrum of, uh, of these uh, effects. And then, importantly, there was this signal that emerged as well. In the Impareg trial, empagliflozin showed this major benefit on reducing hospitalization, risk of hospitalization for heart failure. Nobody saw this coming. Now, we saw none of this coming, okay, with these CBOTs. But this heart failure effect turned out to be robust and new and really uh, significant. Now, what I'm going to show you here in the next uh, few slides is something that the color code is going to be helpful because what you see here are the SGLT2s and their effects on um, CV outcomes, major adverse cardiovascular events. And this is all of them, okay, including the one that has not been reported out yet, Virtus, ertogliflozin. Four of the five that have been completed showed superiority. They showed statistical significance in reducing the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events. One, DECLARE, had a dual uh, uh, in, in point, okay, had, uh, uh, one did not show uh, uh, superiority, but the second primary endpoint did show, uh, in fact, uh, superiority, okay, and, and in fact, the indications that are being sought at the FDA for these uh, uh, drugs are in fact mapped with what they showed superiority for. Now the SGLT2 inhibitors are very important drugs, mysterious in some ways because they exert their benefits at the level of the kidney and we look at all of these Venn diagrams to see that the, these drugs modulate a range of factors that are all related to reducing CV risk. So the question is frequently asked, what is the mechanism that explains the reduction in risk for CV death, for, for uh, non-fatal MI, for non-fatal stroke, and so forth with these SGLT2 inhibitors? We don't know. And whenever you see this many Venn diagrams, whenever you see nine different lines and, and dotted lines, and so, we don't know. But there are a, a lot of things that are contributing, and we are still working on it. But for the moment, let's celebrate the outcomes, okay? Now, when you look at the uh, CV outcomes with Impareg, uh, uh, CV death, I told you, was the thing that drove most of the st statistical significance. There was also a reduction in all-cause death. But we see now this hospitalization risk for heart failure an all-cause hospitalization. And the important thing is that this was improved, the risk was, was reduced, the outcomes were improved with impaired CKD uh, renal function. In other words, we've known for a long time, and you'll hear more about the relationship between CKD and these uh, uh, outcomes and the use of these uh, uh, drugs in the, in, the, in the next talk, but the fact of the matter is that the, the, the uh, surprise finding that was really, really uh, Im important and has now started to drive uh, a, a different pattern of use of these agents are the effects that they have on hospitalization for heart failure. What you see here is across all of these um, uh, outcomes trials, doesn't matter which of the SGLT2 inhibitors we're talking about, they all do the same things when it comes to reducing the risk for hospitalization for heart failure. All of them show, in yellow, statistical significance. We don't know what urticlofloxin will show, but the chances are pretty strong that it, it will fall in line, okay? So we're starting to see now effects on CV outcomes across the board, and those CV outcomes include a reduction of risk with, uh, for uh, hospitalization uh, for heart failures. That's with the SGLT2 inhibitors. Well, quickly, the GLP-1s, very different drugs. These are peptides. They're not oral agents. 
And these peptides have pleiotrophic effects, okay? They do things in the brain, they do things uh, in the pancreas, in the liver, and they have effects on muscle and adipose tissues. But it's the effects that they have on the heart that we are now um, really focusing on. And, and what we also know is that these GLP-1s are associated with a small increase in heart rate, a modest reduction in body weight and in blood pressure, but these outcomes trials are now changing the game. Because this is what we see using that same color code, the cardiovascular outcomes with GLP-1s. Across the board, all of these, including the oral GLP-1, they are now showing up with the longer acting agents showing statistical significance that uh, gives them now superiority claims uh, against their primary um, outcomes. Now, there was not superiority with, with Pioneer and with the shorter acting uh, GLP ones, okay? But this was an oral, remember, and this was a short acting um, uh, set of uh, GLP ones. Those are the ones that have not yet shown uh, superiority. I bring your attention to the oral um, uh, trial, Pioneer 6 because this was the smallest of the trials, and it's the shortest duration. So the likelihood that you had non-superiority, you didn't have superiority established there, may have been because it was just too short and too small for an event-driven trial to give you those results. And so uh, because of that, uh, the, the, age, the, the company that uh, has sponsored this trial is really using this data in combination with data from the injectable form of this same drug uh, to try to get an indication for reduction of risk of CV disease. So we'll just have to wait and see how that turns out. So this is a lot of stuff. What has it all taught us? Well, the CVOTs have led to a paradigm shift in how cardiologists and healthcare practitioners conceptualize the treatment of type 2. The new evidence has triggered a reevaluation of the pathogenesis uh, and the pathways of pathogenesis that link diabetes to cardiovascular disease. We don't know all of what the mechanisms are, and we are beginning now to study that with more intensity, but the fact that these, these newer drugs are having these outcomes has opened up new avenues for investigation. We now have a deeper understanding of the pathophysiology of both the cardio cardiovascular and the cardiorenal uh, complications in type 2 diabetes, and it's going to be increasingly important that across specialties, cardiologists, diabetologists, nephrologists optimize all of the components of vascular preventive therapy and protection in patients with diabetes. Now, there are, in fact, some limitations here. And the fact is that we can't begin yet to generalize uh, these outcomes trials, okay? Um, they all have been done for the most part with the exception of rewind. They were all done with, in patients who had very high levels of cardiovascular risk. They don't look like the patients that you generally see day in and day out, okay? Um, we, 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 we have to have, uh, there's been a short time for uh, assessing the potential benefits. Now, I, I just want to point out a couple of opportunities for improvement. Um, we need to build on the results that we've seen in Rewind because this was a more diverse uh, population, a lot more people without established cardiovascular disease, so we'll get some indication of uh, primary prevention from that trial. Uh, we need the benefit of longer-term follow-up, but that's an ethical dilemma sometimes. If you have drugs out there already that have proven benefits and you show benefit in a trial that you're doing, it's hard to ethically justify driving the trial longer when you know that you may very well take people out of, uh, out of harm's way uh, by ending the trials. We need more active comparators, and it's going to be increasingly difficult to do placebo-controlled trials now that we have so many drugs that are effective. And I won't go through all of this, but the fact is that we need to start standardizing definitions, outcomes, measures. We need to have less reliance on A1C. What we're really interested in is we want to know about time and range. 
which is a much more physiologically relevant outcome of glycemic control. We need to know what are the, oh Lord, what, uh, what are the events that are happening, okay? And what are the CVD uh, outcomes uh, that are happening? These things, uh, we need to find ways of putting these things on a matrix that we can score. And, and, and we need to have more involvement in advocacy uh, organizations. Now, I don't need to do this because Sharita has already shown you that the ADA has really put a new emphasis on how we do decision making. When you have people on metformin and lifestyle, the first thing that you have to do if they're still above target and you want to intensify therapy, you need to first evaluate whether or not they have AFCBD, okay? If they do, now you have to start thinking differently. You have to start thinking about uh, using a GLP-1 receptor agonist with proven benefit or an SGLT-2 that you've already heard about that has uh, benefit if the EGFR is in the right range. If heart failure or CKD, kidney disease predominates, then the preferable agent is an SGLT2 with evidence of a heart failure benefit, okay? Uh, or an SGLT2 that, uh, or if the SGLT2 is not tolerated or contraindicated, uh, and the EGFR is less than the threshold for use, uh, you might use a GLP-1 that uh, has proven uh, benefit. And then if there is no established ASCVD or CKD, now you have to start do using those individual judgments. If you want to minimize hypoglycemia risk, you heard this already, you can use all of these agents that don't have a big risk. If there's compelling need to minimize the weight gain or to promote weight loss, now you have to choose agents that are known to do that, okay? And then there are these new recommendations that have included for CV disease risk management in type 2 diabetes. Metformin, though standby, has neutral effects on heart failure, potential benefit on ASCVD, neutral to potentially modest weight loss effects, but now the new players, the ones that have risen in the ranks, are the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 receptor agonists for all of the reasons that we've uh, already uh, talked about. Now, the question is, what can we do now to improve outcomes? Well, preferably use those agents that address the specific pathophysiological needs in patients. Be more vigilant in the assessment of the clinical profile and risk status of individual patients, we need to do more regularly those things that we ought to be doing anyway. That's how we minimize risk and optimize potential uh, benefit. Revise the standard of care and use appropriate combination therapies earlier and often. Avoid inertia, you'll hear more about that, and, and intensify earlier. And then promote adherence and simplification and facilitation of patient engage, engagement, not only based on, based on evidence-driven uh, outcomes, but real-world evidence as well. And, and, and in the interest of time, I won't detail a lot of this, but we need to think in terms of what's broken, what needs to be fixed as we individualize patient decisions. If the patient needs weight loss, if that's a predominant um, urgency, we have agents now that are desirable. We have agents that are less desirable. And then there are other important considerations that need to factor into uh, our, our thinking. If you think about the fact that we, we've already talked about established CBD and, and, and those kinds of things, we, we've already reviewed uh, what's available. But if I look here and we think about uh, elevated A1Cs because of increased postprandials, Fastings look okay, but they have high A1Cs because postprandials are not. We now have agents that specifically can address those kinds of defects. Agents that don't have much of an effect on that. And these are the kinds of thought processes that we should have. So let me wind this down with a prediction. I think a new day is coming for type 2 diabetes and the prediction that I share with you is this. Based on everything that we've learned and the astonishing new capabilities of the 
what we call modern NIADs, the modern non-insulin anti-diabetes drugs, it is likely that in the not too distant future, the vast majority of people with type 2 diabetes will be treated early and often with a combination regimen that will consist of a GLP-1, an SGLT2 inhibitor, plus or minus metformin, because co-formulations are really easy with metformin these days, and low-dose pioglitazone. Some proof is already beginning to emerge for this kind of approach. The kata, that's Q-A-T-A-R, we call it Qatar, but the kata study uh, showed that if you use conventional combination therapy with basal bolus therapy, metformin, sulfonylurea, compared to a, an early triple therapy combination that contains a GLP-1, metformin, pioglitazone, what you see is that you get not only earlier but more sustained achievement of substantial reduction in A1C, but not just that. Because this was a study, they looked at analyses of beta cell function. And with that combination triple therapy early on, what you see is that by 36 months, there was essentially normalization of beta cell function which is what thing that, what, one of the things you can accomplish with a combination like a GLP-1 and low-dose pyoglitazone. So we're starting to see evidence that there's a lot that we can do about the progression of the disease and about the prevention of cardiovascular disease and complications using these newer approaches. So finally, what can we do? Well, we can use agents that address the needs of our patients. Be more vigilant in assessing what's wrong with the individual in front of you. Especially be vigilant about whether there is or is not the presence of ASCBD, because that's now guiding next steps in therapy. And then change the standards of care. Use appropriate therapies, more appropriate therapies, earlier and often. And then don't fall victim to inertia. Earlier intensive therapy, including combination therapy, taking advantage of everything that we know about evidence-based as well as real-world evidence uh, in the process. So that's all I have. Heaven only knows what my, oh, there it is. There's Judy. Okay. You remember Judy? Okay. Uh, the, the, 56-year-old lady, you know, who had all this stuff with her, you know, the brother died and so forth. She didn't take a diabetes medication, want to. She had uh, lifestyle modifications. She took blood pressure medicines and statins. Uh, once she started taking metformin, uh, she was on exercise and metformin. She added a DPP-4 um, uh, and uh, her weight went up. Uh, LDL came down. The blood pressure started to look better. Uh, but she was still at an A1C of 8.5, despite the stuff that she had done. And the question is, what would you do next for intensification of Judy? Okay? Would you now, according to the guidelines, not according to what's up in your head, would you <laughs> intensify her treatment using just anything, anything that's available? Or would you now, before you add something, evaluate her for the presence of ASCBD? Would the guidelines say, in Judy, you need to achieve a blood pressure less than 130 over 80 and an LDL less than 85? Would the guidelines tell you that you need to consider a fixed dose combination in order to simplify her treatment? Or do the guidelines say none of these are recommended? So please answer. Okay, y'all made me look so good. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. So, because y'all were everywhere at first. But yes, yeah, the, the next step would be to evaluate for ASCBD, and then I think uh, the the the, uh, the second case was, it's coming. it's coming. Okay, that's Tom, and you you remember Tom? He had type two diabetes. He's kind of he's he's has a big BMI, uh, heavy travel schedule. He's had some exertional chest pain. Uh, his treatment plan was statins. 
a channel blocker, lifestyle modification, metformin, and a DPP-4 inhibitor. Dropped a little weight, exercise tolerance improved, A1C still high. So the question becomes, what are you going to now, according to the guidelines, what are you going to recommend for tongue? Are you going to uh, do the guidelines say, you need to optimize his risk factor reduction using every bit of all of the standards of care, add an SGLT2 inhibitor while monitoring his EGFR, or consider a once weekly GLP-1, he's got a busy life, uh, but you can't do it, you need to stop the DPP-4, or consider these other factors, his obesity, his EGFR, his lifestyle, the guidelines tell you any one of these or that all of these are currently supported. Please vote. So I can sit down. <laughs> okay, you all already had knocked this one out of the park, so I didn't do I didn't do much on this one. Uh, very good. Thank you all very much.